Amen. Uh, well, over the last few weeks, as you know, um, we've been reexamining our core beliefs um, within the context of prayer because if we're really going to do what God's called us to do, we really have to um, receive all the resources that he has for us. It's like going to the uh, construction site and you don't have your hammer and you don't have your saw and yet you're called to do certain things, right? It's like for every job, there are certain tools you need. Even in, the, in, the, in terms of Christian ministry, there are tools you need to do effective job for what God calls us to do. And, and through this series, I'm hoping that you will receive all that you need, that you can be effective in the kingdom, in your family, in your marriage, in your, uh, uh, the workplace, in the school, wherever you are. Um, I, I was going to complete this series, but I really feel there's two last things we, I, I, that I feel the Lord wants us to deal with. So this week, I'm going to talk about praying from our new covenant position, and next week we're going to pull it all together, okay? Uh, but quickly, uh, the, as a review, we've shared a lot of principles, but six core principles. Number one, we have to obviously pray with the right motives. That just, it just makes sense. We have to pray with the right motives. God discerns the hearts. Uh, we must pray with the right understanding that God has already moved, and therefore we're not trying to get him to move, but we're trying to receive from him what he's already done for us, okay? Uh, number three, you have to pray with the right perspective of believing and receiving. Prayer is primarily about believing and receiving, not about trying to trick God into doing anything. God cannot be tricked, okay? We're about just understanding what he's done, what the new covenant is really all about, and then receiving it into our lives. Uh, number four, we have to pray out of a life of communion with God. It's not about spending 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, uh, a certain time of the day. If it doesn't work for your spouse, guys. It's not going to work with God, okay? It's about daily communion, not just giving them a certain number of minutes a day. It's not about giving God a certain number of minutes a day. Even if it's six hours, that's still not exactly what God wants. God wants a communion with him through the day. Number five, we have to pray the solution, not the problem. God already knows the problem. We have to declare the solution. When we declare the problem, we just add to the problem. We just pronounce the problem. We just keep declaring into the heavenlies, this is the problem, and we just make the problem bigger. We have to start declaring the solution, okay? And number six, we have to pray from a new covenant understanding, which brings me us into today to pray from a new covenant position. Um, before I really get into that, there's just the first thing in your notes there. Um, I, was, I wasn't going to share this, but it's come up again this week. And it's so, so important that we understand this first issue here. Learning to, that, that we, there are different levels of communion with God. Okay, Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 says, The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay, so here's Adam and Eve with the Lord in the cool of the day. It was not an ecstatic experience. It, they were not there trembling and shaking and, and, and having deep uh, uh, visions and dreams, they were just communing with the Lord in a very gentle, uh, uh, probably quiet way. And, and the reason I say this is that there's this mentality that I've seen, and especially with the rising generation, that really concerns me that when they're like, see, when I became a Christian, there was not any of this renewal stuff. There was not these power encounters. There was just coming into a deep embrace with the Father and with His Son, Jesus, through, through, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And, and in these days, we've seen revivals, we've seen renewals, and our children especially, but even some of us, were having these encounters with God, and, and, and you're shaken to the core, and, and having these deep revelations, and being knocked over by the power of God. But we get this idea that that is the new norm of Christianity, that we have to walk in this ecstatic um, ex experiences all the time. Otherwise, we've somehow backslidden. And, and, and that'd be like, honestly, guys, that'd be like be marrying your spouse and then trying to live your relationship with your spouse at that highest level of intimacy, right? M meaning sex 24 hours a day, Right? Although, you know, deep encounters with your spouse, uh, full enjoyment, pleasure, just ecstatic experience with your spouse. But you guys know, I know, we know, you can't live your relationship at that level all the time. 
There, there are times when, when you, know, you know, it's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe your kids look at you, and because you're just sitting there holding hands, maybe they're thinking in their heads, gee, I guess they just don't have the same depth of relationship they used to have. Look, they're just holding hands now. And I remember when I was a kid, my, my dad used to grab my mother all the time, but now he's just holding hands. I guess their relationship isn't quite as deep as it used to be. Well, we know that's foolishness. And yet so often we see another Christian or we look at ourselves and because we're not in that ecstatic experience, we're saying, oh, my relationship is cooling off. Oh, no, no, it's going deeper or it should be going deeper. And there, there are times with your spouse when the most intimate thing you can do is just hold her hand or his hand or put your hand on their shoulder or just snuggle up to each other or just sit and listen and say nothing. And it's the same with the Lord. You don't, if you try to live at that level of ecstatic experience 24 hours a day, you will, number one, burn out. You will, number two, um, y- your relationship will not last because there are different levels of intimacy with the Lord that you have to experience all of them. So this is an encouragement. As we're talking about prayer, some people believe that you, it's not really prayer unless when you go to pray, you have to weep and wail and travail and cry and get all excited. And it's not the case. Sometimes, you know, there are times to really press into God, but there are other times where we just say, oh, thank you, Lord. As, as Rick was doing today, thank you, God, you love us. It's so good to be in your presence. He didn't cry. He didn't wail. But man, did you feel the presence of God on that? You know, so I just want to really challenge all of you that, that don't try to live your relationship with the Lord at a certain ecstatic level. Learn all the levels of intimacy with the Lord, okay? Learn to commune on different levels with the Lord. And, and let's throw in an uh, advertisement for your marriage. Let's learn to commune on different levels in your relationship with your spouse, too. Because there are times all your spouse needs is a hug and nothing more. And if you try to get more from them, it's, it's more than inappropriate, right? It's actually selfish. Okay. <clears throat> As I said, Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day, and they had an enjoyable time. But it wasn't what we would call today this ecstatic thing. Okay, so let's jump into uh, really what I want to talk about today. I've heard many people say, um, I'm, and I'm going to mess you up today, okay? And, and like I said, at, as I said a couple weeks ago, if you don't buy into everything I'm saying over this series, I don't really care. Um, because I'm trying to challenge you to really consider what you do in prayer and what you believe and see where, where, where it's not accurate or where it's actually a waste of time or where it's uh, um, just not what the Lord has, okay? So if you buy into this 100%, I think you're going to have a blast. But if you don't, that's okay. I want to just challenge you to rethink your beliefs and rethink the way you pray, okay? So I've heard a lot of people say, you know what you do? You just got to grab hold of the Lord, okay? Just grab hold of the Lord and don't let go until he gives you what you're asking for, okay? You know, I've heard that so many times. Just just stay with God until he gives you what you want, <clears throat> But here's the truth. If your heavenly Father has not already supplied your need by his grace, your faith can't make him do it. Your faith can't make God do something that he has not already supplied to you. Um, Yes, everything in the kingdom is received by faith, but your faith can't make God move. Okay? We got to really get this. This is not. This is not. Well, I'm believing God for a Cadillac. Well, <laughs> you may not need a Cadillac really, and a Cadillac may not be best for you anyway. But the things you do need, He's already given you by His grace. That's what we have to receive. All those things that He's already done because He's already moved. Your our faith. Your faith doesn't move God. Your faith just helps you to receive what God's already done for you. Okay? But the good news is God has already done everything we need. So, it's just, you know, it's like, like, but what if I need this? No, God's already given you that. The things you need, God's already given. We have to learn how to receive. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And as I said a couple weeks ago, the heavenly realms is not a million miles this way. The heavenly realms is right here in our midst, but just in a different dimension we can't see. 
You're, the answers to your prayer are not a million miles away. They're right here. We just got to walk into them, receive them from that spiritual realm. I, I remember, I just reading, uh, remember that, uh, was that Daniel that was praying? And, and uh, the, the answer took 21 days. And, and so we get this mentality, we got to pray for 21 days to get God to move. But God's, or the, when the angel actually came with the answer to prayer, the angel, I think it was Michael, right? said, um, God heard you the moment you prayed. But there was 21 days of spiritual warfare to get through the demonic forces. But the answer came the moment you prayed. We just had to get through all those demonic forces, right? We, it's, it's, God's already given you. Sometimes we have to wait, but not because God hasn't heard. So you don't have to cry and cry and cry and cry and cry until God heard. God hears. God heard the first time, Okay. See, God is not waiting for us to beg harder or you get more serious or to try a little bit harder. You know, in fact, God is trying to get his blessings to us as best as he can. He's already poured out all of his blessings, the Bible says. He's just waiting for us to receive. He's trying to get his healing to us. He's trying to get his forgiveness to us. He's trying to get his peace to us, his love to us, his power to us. But we're just not able to receive for some reason, okay? And the problem, therefore, isn't with God's unwillingness or ability to give. The problem with, is our, ability to, with our ability to believe and receive. Because a lot of times our beliefs really do mess us up. You're praying for healing, but in your head you're believing that you deserve this. Or you're praying for healing, but in your head you believe that God has a purpose for this sickness because he wants to teach you a lesson. Well, you're not going to get what, you, what you're praying for if you believe God's got a purpose. See, but, but again, God is not the type of God that has to punish us to get our attention. See, here's the problem. If God didn't need our cooperation, then everyone would already be healed. Uh, there'd be no sickness, there'd be no disease, but the problem is that God has chosen to work through us which is a blessing, but it's also a limitation on God. Because God's chosen to work through each one of us, but we have the opportunity to say no. Or we have the opportunity to disbelieve what he's trying to bless us with. Or we have the opportunity to have some distorted mindset that limits what God can give us. So the good news is God wants to work with us. The bad news is that often we don't cooperate. See, God, God says... Um, <clears throat> God says if we confess our sins, we will receive forgiveness and cleansing, but many of us are too proud to confess. Okay. God says if we believe, we will be healed, but many don't take the time to build a faith that can receive healing. Okay. God says that we would see miracles according to the power that's working in us, but many of us resist the power of God working in us. God says we would drink with joy from the water of the wells of our salvation. But many of us seem to enjoy just wallowing in our problems. If we're not going to drink with joy, we're not going to drink. See, there, there are attitudes and perspectives that we have to have to come in alignment with what God has for us so we can receive. You don't receive with commiseration. You receive with joy. If you don't receive with joy, there's a hindrance to your receiving. You know, do we think for a minute that God wants us to stay full of shame and guilt and remorse and, and sickness and weakness and depression and, and discouragement? Do you really think that God wants us to live that way? Why, like, why do we think Jesus came anyway? John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So if we're not living in that rich and satisfying life, then we're missing out. We haven't received all that God has for us. Right? Because he came to give us that rich and satisfying life, that abundant life, that life to the full, the Bible says. If we're not living there, it's because we haven't received. I, I hear people um, say all the time, not all the time, I hear people say often, 
oh, the church is just in such a mess, you know. Um, you know, it just, oh, it's just bad. It's dry. It's, it's withered up. It's, you know, it's so, it's so dry. We need to pray for revival. That's what we need to do. We just need to pray for revival and beg God to pour out his spirit, and that'll just solve everything. But you know what we're actually saying when we're saying that? We're saying God doesn't want the church to be revived, that God is refusing to revive the church, God is refusing to give water to the church, but we can, we'll have to change his mind by begging him and convincing him, okay? See, we're actually blaming God for the poor condition of the church when we say that. Because we're saying, well, if God really wanted to, he could do it, but he's not, so obviously he doesn't want to but we'll change his mind. We're going to come into the rescue and change God's mind for the church. See, when we're talking like that, when we talk like that, see, we have to think about what we're thinking about. Yeah, that made sense. <laughs> yeah, we have to think about what we're thinking about. We, we, if we talk like that, we're implying that, that God is refusing to pour out his spirit unless we spend enough time begging him. Yet we're implying that God is not moving because he's angry at us or frustrated with us. And so if we would just decide, if we would just stop sinning, if we just decide to, to get right with God and beg God enough, then God will come and move. God doesn't want to bless us, but if we pray enough, if we beg him enough, he'll come and bless us. Boy, what a strange idea we have about God. You know, I've heard it said, and this I have heard said a lot, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's the truth. If God does judge America, he'll have to apologize to Jesus because Jesus already paid the price for his wrath and anger. Jesus died to take on his shoulders the judgment of all the sins of the whole world. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all, for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's you and I, folks. Jesus offered up his life once for all, for all time for all sins. And so if God even judged one person for their sins after the cross, if he even judged even one person for their sins, he's demonstrating that Jesus' death was not good enough. Think about that. And he'd have to apologize to Jesus for sending him to the cross. <clears throat> Now, is North America full of sin? Yes, definitely. Will God judge us for our sin? No, the judgment for our sins has already been placed on the shoulders of Jesus. Are we therefore now safe and secure and problem-free? Definitely not. We're, right now, we are giving devil lots of room all over North America. And we are definitely going to pay a high price for our sin and disobedience. But the price isn't going to be paid towards God. It's going to be paid as the natural consequence for all of our foolishness. Yeah, as a nation, we've turned our back on God. And we do need to repent and turn from our self-destructive ways. But we don't need to beg God to send revival. We don't need to beg God to pour out his Holy Spirit because Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago. Look what it says, Acts chapter 2, 14 to 17. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles, and he shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you. What you see, right? Remember, they were drunk around, walking around like drunken men, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they're speaking in other tongues. They says, What you see now was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel in the last days, meaning now God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. And he did. 2,000 years ago. God's Spirit was poured out all over the earth 2,000 years ago. We don't have to ask God to pour out His Spirit anymore. We just need to humble ourselves, repent of our disobedience, allow the Holy Spirit to fill each one of us, and stay full of the Holy Spirit, 
and then allow him to lead us so that we stop stifling the moving of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives. See? We don't have to say, God, pour out your Holy Spirit. He's already done that. What we need to do is say, God, fill me again. Fill me again. Fill me again. God, help me to obey you. Help me to serve you. Help me to not resist your Holy Spirit. See, you know, <clears throat> many people think, you say, what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And they'll go, uh, the middle white page? <laughs> you know, they think that's the only thing separating the New and the Old Testament. Um, one blank page in the Bible is all there is. Um, but in reality, almost everything changed between the Old and the New Testament. Almost everything changed because of what Jesus did on the cross. You know, people refer to the destruction. Well, where am I now? <clears throat> people refer to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah under the Old Covenant, right? God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. And they used Abraham as an example of how you can plead with God to change God's mind, right? Abraham said, well, if there's only, if there's 50, what if there's only 40 righteous people? What if there's only 30 righteous people? And he went down to 10, right? And they said, oh, there's an example of a man able to be a mediator between God and man. And Abraham was standing in the gap and pleading to God and getting God to change his mind so that he wouldn't judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And so they said, now what we need to do is we need to be like Abraham. We need to stand in the gap between God and man. We need to beg God to withhold his wrath and hold, withhold his anger so he doesn't judge us. Well, here's, here's a couple problems I have with that. Number one, God already knew there weren't 50 or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10 righteous people in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. Why was he dealing with, with Abraham then? And, and actually, Abraham certainly didn't change God's mind, did he? Judgment still came. See, I personally believe that God was actually just testing Abraham to see if Abraham really had a heart for the people. Because right after this, Abraham was called to be a patriarch over a brand new people group called the Israelis. And if you study your Bible, you'll see that the number one requirement for someone that's being called to be a patriarch is to have a deep sacrificial love for people. In the same way when God said to uh, Abraham earlier, sacrifice your son, Isaac. God didn't want to sacrifice Abraham's son. It was a test to see if Abraham's heart was fully turned in obedience to God. And I think the same thing was happening here. <clears throat> but see, the other thing is, even if Abraham was trying to be a mediator between God and man, it was under the old covenant Look what the New Covenant says about mediators. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. There is now one God and one mediator. There's only one between God and men. The man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. God now doesn't need another mediator between his wrath and our sin. He already has the one. And he says there's only one now. Okay? Jesus is the one and only mediator, and he has already mediated between our righteous, and sinf our righteous God and sinful man. Once and for all, Jesus is the only mediator. You know, after the terrorist attack <clears throat> um, on the uh, trade towers in New York City on September the 11th, 2001, a lot of people said, look, God's judgment has come to America now because of our many sins. So let's, let's, let's repent and beg God for mercy or he's going to do even more terrible things. That's what I heard all over the place. What were they in effect? What were they, but here's, here's what they were in effect saying. They were saying, Jesus, uh, you did a lousy job of being a mediator between God and men because God's still having to pour his judgment. So I guess you didn't do such a great job after all. He didn't go far enough or pay a high enough price, Jesus. And so God's still angry. But don't worry, we've raised up some intercessors and they're going to finish the job that you started. That's what we're saying. People of God, Jesus was the perfect mediator and he's already bro brokered a peace deal between God and man. Right? Romans 5 verse 1. 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. There's no retribution when you're, when you're in peace. There's no counterattacks. There's no judgment. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God is no longer angry at mankind. Sin is no longer a problem with God because our sin was atoned for. And so God is not ready to destroy any country. And he's not wanting to destroy any country. But the problem is that when, <clears throat> when we try to be a mediator between God and man, we're actually trying to play, take the place of Jesus, who's the one and only mediator. If we pray, oh God, please have mercy, don't pour out your wrath, we've just kind of pushed Jesus aside. We said, oh, Jesus, I know that you died and atoned for sin, and I know the Bible says you're the only mediator, but I think you need my help in this case. And so I'm gonna, it's going to take my pleading and interceding to make things right with God. So step aside, Jesus, and let me finish what you started. See, now again, <laughs> thank God that he is indeed a merciful God and that our sins have been atoned for, because otherwise, when we try to do that in Jesus' place, we could be in a lot of trouble. Right? We could be toast. Because, see, when you try to take the place of Jesus, that's what the Antichrist does. He tries to take the place of Jesus. And so when we try to take the place of Jesus, even as a mediator, that, well, connect the dots, right? But thank God that Jesus' atonement was so perfect and so complete that even in our foolishness, God will not punish us for something as silly as that. God is no longer angry. His wrath has poured, been poured out of his son, and his justice is satisfied because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, if God isn't angry with us, do we still need to preach? Do we still need to worry about our life and our, you know, what we do? Well, of course we do. See, God, God has made provision now for everyone to be saved. But, yeah, to receive salvation, but each person still has to receive it for themselves. So we still have to communicate to give them the offer of salvation. See, hell was only prepared for the devil and his angels, the Bible tells us. Hell was only for the devil and his angels. It was never meant for man. But if we choose to reject salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and instead stay aligned with the devil and his works, then we get the same punishment he gets because we're under his kingdom and under his punishment. But hell was never meant for mankind. It's like when, when, uh, uh, in the Second World War, when, when uh, uh, Japan surrendered, when the emperor of Japan surrendered, everybody in Japan, whether they knew th there was a war or not, were also, um, what's the word? They were defeated also. They were also under the unconditional surrender dictate of the emperor. And one day, Satan is going to unconditionally surrender. And all those who stay aligned to him will suffer his fate. Not because God wants it. God paid a price so that none of us would have to suffer that. That's why salvation is so important. That's why personally giving our lives to Jesus Christ is so important. Because we come out of alignment with the kingdom of darkness and come into alignment with the kingdom of God's dear son. And we never have to worry ever again about judgment. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> See, so our sins have already been forgiven. Jesus paid the price for our sins. What sends us to hell is not an individual sin. Well, if you do that, brother, you're going to hell. It's not true. Well, you're involved in this sexual deviancy. You're going to hell. That's not true. There's only one sin that sends us to hell, and that's the sin of refusing to accept Jesus. None of those other things send us to hell. They mess up our lives royally, but they don't send us to hell. The only thing that sends us to hell is rejecting Jesus' payment for our sins. Everything revolves around Jesus and what he's done for us. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven 
given to men by which we must be saved. Only Jesus. God's made it so simple. Made it so simple. See, when we stand before God, he's not going to ask us about all our sins. He's, he's not going to, um, he's only going to ask one thing. He's going to say, did you receive my son? Did you accept his payment for your sins? That's the only thing he's going to ask. He's not going to bring remembrance all those other things you did, those ways you failed, those things you did. He's not going to talk about them at all. He's just going to say, did you receive my son? The only question he is going to ask each one of us is, what have you done with Jesus? That's the only question. What have you done with Jesus? So when you pray for people, don't pray that God will be merciful and turn away his wrath from them. There's no wrath on on people anymore. What do we do then? We pray for people that their eyes would be opened that their eyes would be opened and their hearts would be softened and they would accept Jesus' payment for their sins, right? Because the Bible says that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers that they may not perceive the light of the gospel. So if we're going to pray for the lost, pray for open eyes. Declare sight to the spiritually blind and pray their hearts would be softened that they would receive God's wonderful gift of salvation. Talk more about that in a couple minutes. Psalm 116, verse 5. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Now, here's a wonderful Old Testament verse. The Lord is gracious, gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. How much more is that true today after the cross? But even in the Old Testament, our Lord is gracious and, compa- and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. See, but the problem is many, many people treat God like he's against us. Um, And he doesn't want to answer our prayers, and that's why we have to beg him and wear him down until he just gives up and answers our prayers. See, we have such a distorted picture of God. Even with some of our theology, we're taught in different churches around the world today. There's such a distorted theology about who God is and what he's like. See, we actually think... And these are all examples that I've actually heard, so that's why I'm saying them. We actually, some people actually think that God wants babies to be born with birth defects as punishment for their disobedience. I've heard that said. If you hadn't sinned, your baby wouldn't be, be born that way. We actually think that he puts cancer on people to teach them a lesson. Heard that one too. Or here's a wonderful one. We actually think that he allows people to die in in an apartment fire because there was a porno shop next door that God was judging and they got the overflow of the flames. Oh, yeah, it's too bad they live so close to that porno shop. God's judgment just came on them too. I've heard these foolish things. Now, how on earth can we come boldly before the throne of grace to ask God in our times of hell, in our times of need, if we believe that our God does that? I'd be hiding. I wouldn't be praying anything, you know. But because many of us believe that God is like that, we have to, we we start to believe that we have to stand in the gap between God and man and pray so that God will be merciful and not judge us. We approach God as our adversary, as our enemy, not as our friend, not as our lover, not as our father. And we accuse God of having this judgmental character who delights in the suffering of sinners. And then we wonder why our prayers aren't working. (laughs) See, instead of believing that God wants to bless us, we believe that we need to beg God to heal people because he's not as compassionate as we are. Because if he was, he would have healed them. I even heard, this one guy even confessed to me. He said he was in a prayer meeting once, and he said, God, if you even love this city as half as much as we do, you'd do something. Wow. Then he came to his senses and realized what he just prayed. <laughs> yeah, we wonder why our prayers are not working, and, and it's a, actually a wonder why we're not just a pile of ashes for all the foolish things we do and believe. The only reason God's not angry with us is because Jesus did such a good job at atoning for our sins. Really. 
2 Corinthians 5, 14. For Christ's love compels us. Christ's love propels us. That word compels in the Greek, I can't remember the Greek word, but it means to, to shoot us forth like, a, like a, 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 a something from a cannon. He catapults us outwards to bless others. Christ's love compels us. He canonize, canonizes, he cannonballs us out towards help other people. <clears throat> yeah, not canonizes. <laughs> I almost had a new word there. See, because human nature is, is um, basic, uh, basic human nature is to be selfish, to, be, to generally not care about other people, okay? If we care for people, it's because, it, you know, if, if we care for people, if we want them to be saved, we want them to be blessed, that and delivered, it's proof that Christ's love has touched our hearts, right? It says God's love compels us. Christ's love compels us. He stirred it up. He's given us compassion, but not so we can plead with him to be as merciful as we are, but to motivate us to start releasing God's power that he's already put with inside of us. See, when he says Christ's love compels you, it means that he stirs you to want to give to others what he has given to you. Which includes the power of God, but also includes forgiveness, mercy, love, compassion, care, empathy. Christ's love compels us to demonstrate his kingdom to others. So how, how can we bring revival to our nation? Okay. How, how can we actually bring revival to our nation? Like we've discovered that we don't have to try to force God because he wants revival more than we do. We've discovered that we don't have to be a mediator between God and man and beg for mercy because Jesus is that mediator and he's already done the job. And we've discovered that Jesus has already poured out his Holy Spirit on the earth and that spirit and his power reside in each side, reside inside of each one of his believers. How do we get revival then? How do we revive? We can't beg God to do something. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. <clears throat> you understood. You heal the sick. You raise the dead. You cleanse those who have leprosy. You drive out demons. Freely you have received, so freely give. God told every believer to go out and demonstrate the power of the kingdom. To, to other people. But instead of doing what he commanded us to do, we stay at home and intercede that God would do what he told us to do. Right? We stay at home and we ask God to do what he told us to do. We pray, oh God, would you please heal that person? And God said, no, I told you to. God, would you please bring deliverance to that person? God said, no, I, I told you to. Well, that person, you know, that, you know, that person is suffering. They're depressed. Couldn't you do something? God said, well, I told you to. See, when God decided to be in partnership with us, it really limited him. Because if we don't, it doesn't happen. Even though everything we need, he's already given us. Because of our poor understanding of prayer and our poor understanding of God, instead of going out, we go into our prayer, prayer closets and we take Jesus' place as the only mediator. We beg God to withhold the anger that he no longer has towards us. We cry out to God to pour out his Holy Spirit, which he's already poured out. And we plead with him to become as merciful and compassionate as we are. <laughs> I, I, I know that sounds terrible, and I... Like, Where'd that spirit of sarcasm come, Pastor Dave? I'm just trying to really help us to understand how we've been praying amiss, how we've been believing amiss. <clears throat> how on earth can we see revival come to our nation? <laughs> to, to coin an old phrase, we've got to come out of our closets. Instead of staying in our prayer closets and praying, do we need to pray in our prayer closets? Yes, right, Marilyn preached a wonderful message on the secret place. Do you have a secret place? We've got to have a secret place and get in with God and pray. 
But then we got to come out of our closet at some point. We have to. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. This, the, the word of God says that in order for people to be born again, they have to have an encounter with the word of God. They have to encounter with the imperishable seed of the word of God. So if people come to Christ through receiving the imperishable seed of the word of God, then we should be out planting that seed into people's lives. There's no use staying home and praying for someone's salvation if salvation only comes through the word of God, through the seed of the word of God. Someone's got to say it. it and, and, and honestly, I'll go even further than that. It's no use to even just pray for someone to be healed if we don't follow up and say, would you like me to now tell you who healed you and why? Because Jesus loves you. If we don't, then there's still no imperishable seed. Is there a power encounter? Yes. Is there a demonstrated the kingdom? Yes. Is there an imperishable seed that's been gone, been se- sown into their heart? No. We've got to learn how to do the works of God, but we also have to speak the word of God. So often we just stay in our prayer closet and claim souls. Instead, we should be going out and winning souls by planting the seed of the word of God. Okay? See, you know that Jesus never sent his disciples out to intercede and do spiritual warfare? After they had prayed, then they went out to demonstrate the power of the kingdom and plant the seed of the word of God. So how can we bring revival to our nation? It's on, I think, your last page there. How can we bring revival to our nation? Number one, pray for spiritual sight for others. Here's what you can do in your prayer closet. Here's what you can do on the bus. Here's what you can do at the workplace. Here's what you can do at at, at Tim Hortons or McDonald's, wherever you go. 2 Corinthians Corinthians 4.4, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of God or um, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, okay? God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They can't see the light of the gospel. Like, they're blind. They're blinded. Before I was a Christian, I was blinded. People tried witnesses to me. I was completely blinded. They tried to harass me. They tried to share the gospel with me. They tried everything. I was blinded. Until some of them got so frustrated with me, they said, you know what? We're going to have to pray for this guy. So they got together in a little huddle, and they prayed for me, and suddenly I had sight. Then the, I was open to the gospel. Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So we need to use our authority that Jesus has given us over Satan to bind him and command spiritual blindness to go. So Satan, stop it. I command blindness to come on that person. I command sight to come on that person. I break off all spiritual blindness. Suddenly people's eyes are open, but that's still not enough, right? Now they need to hear the gospel. So B, pray for workers and volunteer to be one. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Here, here's something I see. When we, see. when we pray for our loved ones, you know what I hear so often? We say, oh God, I have a loved one in Toronto or in wherever, Ottawa or in uh, Quebec City. And oh God, I pray that you would send them some people to witness to them. Thank you, God. Now, that's, that's an okay prayer, right? God, would you just move people to come in divine connection with my relatives and pray for them? And we're believing God that God will send people. But here's the problem. There's people in Ottawa and Toronto and Quebec City going, oh God, would you please send some people to my loved ones in Broussard, in Montreal, in Greenfield Park, in LaSalle, to witness to them. We're expecting God to move people in those other cities for our relatives that are over there, but we are, are we willing to be the answer to their prayer over here? <clears throat> We're praying for Christians over there, but Christians are, over there are praying for Christians over here. Are we willing to be an answer to prayer to someone else? And to, and to share the imperishable word of God here in this city, in this region, in this, in this province. So 
Yes, pray that God would send people to your loved ones, but then volunteer to be a messenger too. Okay. C, demonstrate the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. What are those who believe? They're called believers. Sounds like you and I. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. That goes on. It says they will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. We only, are we believing believers or are we unbelieving believers? Right? If we're believing believers, the Bible says we will do those things. Why aren't we doing them? Because we're not trying to do them. Okay? Sure, I had to pray for a number of dozens of people before someone was healed, but eventually somebody got healed. And now I see a lot of people healed. Not everyone. But just even last week, my, we had a surprise birthday party for my mom. She called me up half an hour before the party and said, Dave, I'm really sick. My heart has doubled in its heart rate. My blood pressure has gone to half. I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to see my, my 80th birthday. So my wife and I went over there. We laid hands on her. We prayed for her. We dragged her out to the birthday party. And uh, the next day, she called me, and I prayed for her again after. Next day, she called me up. And she's not a believer yet. You know what she said to me? She said... I am so much better today. And your sister thinks it's because I took a pill. Isn't she silly? <laughs> she knew that God healed her through the power of prayer, right? God's working. But we had to speak it. We had to put some word into her, right? <clears throat> and, and in my experience, if you walk up to people and show honest concern, 90% will say, yeah, I'll, I'll, you can pray for me. 90%. If you show valid concern, not if you go up as, as like Eddie Evangelist, you know, like, you know, and you go after them. If you, but you say, man, you look, you look, you're struggling. What happened here? And they tell you a little story. I said, man, that must be really painful. Would it be okay if I prayed for you? Okay. 90% will say yes. D, plant the seed of the word of God. See, once you've demonstrated the kingdom, you got their attention, you've got to plant the seed of the word of God. We've already read it, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Do the works of God, but then share clearly the gospel of God, the word of God. You should be able, you should be able to give the gospel presentation in 60 seconds or less. Some people take 20 minutes. Most people don't have 20 minutes. There's this great, uh, what's it called? Uh, is it called livechurch.tv or something like that? There's a guy in any way. His name is Craig Grotzel, and he's got this uh, a network of churches. He preaches for 29 minutes, and then for 60 seconds he presents the gospel, and he sees people saved every week. He's learned how to communicate the gospel in a practical clear way in 60 seconds and sees people saved every week. We've got to learn how to do that. How do you do? Craig Grotzel, um, I can't spell it. It's G-R-O-E, Grotzel, I don't know. Anyway, I'll try to get you the link. Um, he's, he's got a network of churches. Uh, thousands of people now belong to his network. But it's just amazing. We, but the gospel is simple. Why do we make it so difficult? Okay. In one or two minutes, you should be able to share. Because in a lot of cases, it's all you have, right? If you're on the bus or you're wherever, you've only got a minute or two. But it doesn't take that long to share the pure gospel. So after we've demonstrated the kingdom, plant the word of God, and then he, then disciple those who respond to God's word. Matthew 28, 19, we all know, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. See, once a person received Christ, don't leave them hanging. Yeah. Don't abandon them. Because if you do, a wolf will pick them up, right? Like, if you sh share the gospel with someone and they respond, if you walk away from them, it's like abandoning a baby on a doorstep, right? Right? And so, so all you have to do is say, if, if they respond to the gospel, say, man, I'm so, I'm so happy for you. Could we meet again for coffee? I just talk a little bit more. That's all it takes. And then you have another meeting and you say, you know what? I want to invite you to my church that so you can get into a good, a good church. Or if they're from, you know, if they live in Laval, then know at least the name of a good church in Laval. Know a good a name of a good church on the West Island. Know a name of a good church on the East. Know a, a name of a couple good French churches, a couple good English churches, depending on where they live. Don't, don't force them to, to go two hours to get to church. Unless they choose to, right? 
But give them, make sure that they find a family. Because every baby has the right to a safe, healthy family. And so we, we, if we see them become Christians, we got to give them up that place. <clears throat> never abandon a newborn babe in Christ. Never. Jesus never told us to make converts. He told us to make disciples. Here, a, a little segue, just for a minute. Two things that really struck me this last couple months. One was Matthew chapter 28, 1920. He says, go, on to, go into, number one command, go into the world and make disciples. He didn't say go in the world and evangelize. He said, go in the world and make disciples. Command of the Lord. When we get to the end of our lives, and we say, well, I didn't make this great, huge ministry for you, Lord. They'll say, oh, that's okay. Well, God, I didn't have this big network of, 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 of churches or this big, uh, you know, mi- uh, satellite ministry. He says, that's okay. But he'll say, but did you make some disciples? See, if we get to the end of our life and we got lots of money and lots of ministry, but we've never made a disciple, we've disobeyed his greatest command. The other thing Jesus said that really hit me was, follow me, follow me, and as a consequence, I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I'll make you all millionaires. He didn't say, he didn't say I'd make you all presidents of companies. But he'd say, he, the, the sign that you're following Jesus is that you're becoming a fisher of men. Now, again, that's not just a call to evangelism. Because a, a fisher, a fisherman, will spy out the water, find out where the best water is, where the fish are budding, go catch the fish, take it in, clean it, and prepare it for use, okay? So again, it's about discipleship, okay? And so Jesus said, if you're truly my disciples, you will become a disciple maker. He didn't say how many, but he did say make disciples. And the greatest sign that we're following Jesus is that we're making disciples, that's a greatest sign. That, that was a segue. <laughs> okay, summary. <clears throat> Make it really simple. Make it really, really simple. Four things, if we're going to see revival come to this nation, four things to give us a healthy, biblical prayer life and a healthy biblical belief system. Number one, believe. When you read it, believe it. Just believe it. Believe, and believe specifically what, though, in terms of prayer? Believe that God has already moved. Believe that he did something so amazing on the cross that sin has been completely atoned for, and all the resources and all the blessings of heaven have been poured out and at our disposal. Believe that, because that's true. Ephesians chapter 1. Believe that God has already moved and done everything that he needs to do. Now it's all in our court. Number two, receive. If you believe, go to the next step and receive those resources. Receive them in faith. Receive them in confidence. Receive them in boldness. Receive them with hunger. But receive. Receive his power. Receive the fullness of his spirit. Receive his blessing. Receive his joy. Don't walk around and depressed. Don't walk around discouraged. You know, we all play mind games. I get discouraged. I get depressed. But then I say, man, what am I doing? Why would I stay in this place when I have the joy of the Lord available to me, right? So you see, you shake it off and say, no, I'm going for the joy of the Lord. I'm choosing the joy of the Lord today. So receive all of his resources. Number three, go out. Get out of your closet. Get out of your prayer closet. After you've believed and received in your prayer closet, then you go out of your prayer closet, and for you do the works of Christ, expressing the love of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. It really is. And you can do this if you're a brand new Christian. You can do this if you've been a Christian for years. It, it, it's just time. It's time to get the church, the church, the worldwide church, on track with God's intention which is to receive the kingdom, demonstrate the kingdom, and then establish the kingdom wherever we go. That's what it's all about. And along the way, have a, just have a blast. Have, it's so much fun. It is so much fun 
ministering to people and seeing, you know, their lives transformed and seeing marriages healed and seeing peace of God come on people. And yes, seeing some people blasted by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a lot of fun. Let's stand to our feet. Uh, Next week, I'm going to pull it all together and and really look at the primary fundamental purpose of prayer, okay? But I just, we need to clarify a lot of thoughts, minds.